All right, thanks for having me. Let's see here. All right, I thought, I thought we'd start out by first uh, uh, covering a few things that I think are important uh, to, uh, and will apply to the whole session. Number one, what defines a high-risk patient and what kind of strategies can we use to optimize them prior to surgery. I wanted to specifically talk a little bit about low flow, um, low gradient uh, aortic stenosis, and then finally uh, just brush on what if the ventricle still doesn't work. If we look at uh, how to define a high risk patient, diminished ejection fraction is always one of the most uh, uh, initial assessments, uh, but other factors are certainly at, pl at play. Can we define a high risk patient by a predicted mortality? Well, we have some affiliate hospitals that work with us and we define it as 5%. That means they have to refer at least an assessment of the patient to our center. But we, we reviewed our reoperative patients and found that in our series, at least, there were over half of the patients that didn't have a defined mortality rate uh, based on the STS database because of an odd procedure. Now, the Euro score you can always use. Um, but the, I think it's really a combination of objective and subjective criteria. There was an Australian survey where they looked at uh, what cardiovascular surgeons uh, used in their own practice to define a high-risk patient. Low EF was the most common uh, uh, issue to assess it. Uh, also, increased Euro score, redo surgery was always considered uh, uh, high risk, uh, at least higher risk than the primary case. Elevated creatinine and other factors. At Toronto General, uh, they looked at 4,500 cabbage patients and retrospectively assessed that 9% of them developed low cardiac output syndrome and that those patients that had a low cardiac output syndrome had a mortality rate that was 17 percent compared to only 1 percent in patients that didn't. Their risk factors for um, low cardiac output are the same as uh, the Australian group had assessed, low ejection fraction and reoperation and emergent or urgent surgery. Uh, this just graphically demonstrates that as the left ventricular ejection fraction gets to below 20 percent they can have a, a very high incidence of low output syndrome and a high mortality, 11%, compared to a normal ejection fraction with mortality, 1%. Elective op obviously has a higher, I mean, a, a lower risk than emergent surgery, but redo operations also had a higher risk. They were able to use a predictive uh, uh, formula in order to uh, identify patients at high risk, and if you had all three of these factors, it could be 80, 90% would develop low cardiac output syndrome. So this could help us identify patients uh, that are at high risk and may need a different approach perioperatively. The STS database was examined as well to look at the impact of ejection fraction on outcomes. And you can see a dramatic difference between patients with a normal ejection fraction who had a death rate of 1.5 uh, versus those with an ejection fraction less than 25%, which had a death rate that was almost uh, five times as high at 7.2. So with cabbage, what they found was that for every 10% decrease in ejection fraction, there was a 19% increase in the odds ratio for operative mortality rate. So an ejection fraction of 40% uh, uh, was 20% worse uh, operative results than an ejection fraction of 50 or higher. With isolated valve procedures, uh, there was the same relationship between decrease in ejection fraction and mortality, and with combined procedures, it could e even be more significant. Looking at the long-term survival also, 2,000 patients that underwent cabbage, there was also not only an impact on operative mortality, but late death as well at one year. So what are strategies for preoperative optimization? Number one, we have to ask a couple of questions. Has the patient been adequately risk stratified? Euroscore STS calculations, what is too high of a risk for your center? If your center doesn't have MCS backup, uh, is this a kind of case that you should uh, undertake? Second, uh, you need to assess the modifiable parameters of end organ dysfunction. Make sure the anemia, anemia is corrected as best we can, as long as it's an elective or, uh, or semi-elective situation, uh, because a decreased hemoglobin can be associated with th three-time risk of uh, operative mortality. Look at the creatinine compared to the last 12 months, see if we can optimize by optimizing output, and look at LFTs and albumin for malnutrition. So, uh, thirdly, is the patient at very high risk or acutely decompensated? Well, is there time for outpatient therapy that can be maximized, or do we need to bring the patient in for a PA catheter with goal-directed therapy and maybe a balloon pump or inotropes? Looking at prophylactic intraortic balloon pump, there was a nice study of five randomized controlled trials. 255 high-risk patients were randomized to balloon pump or no balloon pump preoperatively. These were all high-risk patients. 
they assess the optical mortality and uh, incidence of low cardiac output syndrome, moderate to severe aortic regurgitation and peripheral vascular disease, uh, eliminated them from the studies. So the, looking at the impact of bloom pump on cardiac index, uh, within an hour, the patients on the intraortic bloom pump had a dramatic increase in their cardiac output. And we can see this uh, uh, as well, uh, comparing patients who had them placed one to two hours before surgery compared to patients that had them placed 12 hours or 24 hours before surgery, there was uh, really no substantial difference. So uh, based on these findings, it was a, a thought that just an hour or two of balloon pump would be sufficient. Uh, and the patients who had a preoperative intraortic balloon pump did substantially better than those that had it placed intraoperative or postoperatively for um, uh, low cardiac output syndrome. Not only did it improve output, the balloon pump also improved flow, measuring flow in both the ITA on the left and the saphenous vein on the right. There was a substantial increase in mean flow, maximal flow, and uh, pulsatility index demonstrating that it not only improved uh, cardiac output, but flow to the graphs to maintain uh, uh, patency. Um, looking at uh, impact in off-pump cabbage surgery, actually, the uh, uh, Curie's group from Brussels looked at uh, placing intraortic balloon pumps preoperatively in patients with diminished left ventricular ejection fraction, or they thought might have high risk, and were, they were able to decrease the mortality by 67% and also increase completeness of revascularization as the patients weren't quite so unstable going for the uh, posterior wall vessels. Again, back to that meta-analysis, there was a, a decrease in the mortality rate. The odds ratio is 0.18 if you had a preoperative intraortic bloom pump compared to those that did not have a preoperative intraortic bloom pump, and also there was a dramatic decrease in low cardiac output syndrome. Uh, it not only decreased uh, short-term mortality, but decreased post-operative MI. And looking at the Blackpool uh, balloon pump score, uh, using the score on the left, you can identify uh, a great majority of patients who are going to need a balloon pump post-operatively, and this can also be put into your equation preoperatively to see who you may want to put in a balloon pump uh, prophylactically. Uh, looking at meta-analysis of uh, 2,000 high-risk patients, not only did the balloon pump increase cardiac output, but it also decreased the inc incidence of acute kidney injury and also decreased the need for renal replacement therapy, almost eliminating it, decreasing it by 82%. So how does the balloon pump work? It increases myocardial perfusion during diastole, decreases myocardial oxygen consumption, increases cardiac output, and decreases systemic vasoconstriction. Uh, this is also uh, demonstrates that balloon pumps after myocardial infarction uh, also improved outcomes. Let's look at some inotropes. Levo, which we don't have in the United States yet, but we're doing some trials, uh, FDA trials, and we just completed one where the data is being analyzed. But Levo is a calcium sensitizer with inotropic and vasodilatory effects. It was a randomized controlled trial looking at patients with ejection fractions less than 25%, so pretty high risk patients. And the Levo group was compared to placebo. They found that almost instantly you could tell which patients were on Levo because their cardiac output increased dramatically. Also, their pulmonary artery pressures fell dramatically and stayed that way throughout the early postoperative course. Comparing the outcomes, mortality risk was a quarter in patients who were on Levo versus those that were not, and low cardiac output syndrome was cut in a third. Um, there was another uh, Bayesian network meta-analysis, 46 trials, looking at results with dolbutamine, milrinone, and levo, uh, that demonstrated that uh, comparing these three uh, uh, inotropes, the levo group was uh, substantially did better than the milrinone and the dol dolbutamine groups. So while you want to put them on one inotrope, there may be one that's better than the others. So let's look at low gradient, low EF, AS. We all have seen this curve. Every patient with aortic stenosis needs something done. Uh, but we have to take into account the eyeball test, frailty, in addition to these other factors at, uh, in, in patients with aortic stenosis. The Royal Brompton looked at the six-minute walk test and found that if you can't walk 300 meters in six minutes, that your results are dramatically worse. Um, higher death rate, higher stroke rate. Um, so uh, what are ways that we can potentially improve outcomes in those patients that are frail? A balloon uh, aortic valvuloplasty has been tested to, uh, in patients with low EF and has demonstrated improvement in ejection fraction and has decreased the mortality perioperatively. So we quite frequently now in these frail patients will do uh, a BAV as a bridge to decision to assess their uh, reversibility of uh, frailty, see if their symptoms improve, 
um, and determine the contribution of the aortic stenosis to the other factors that may be limiting uh, out outcomes like COPD and whatnot. For patients whose rehab potential is in question, we can institute an aggressive medical therapy, perform a BAV, and reevaluate the patient to, de to decide whether we want to proceed with an aortic valve replacement or whether there are other issues are, in fact, uh, at, 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 uh, at bay. Cleveland Clinic published a series comparing AVR versus no AVR, and the re results were substantially better in the patients who had AVR, uh, even if they were low gradient, low EF. So we need to do something. So we do a dobutamine stress echo to assess their contractile reserve, looking for improvements in heart function. Uh, if there isn't any contractile reserve, that's when we go with the medical therapy, consider a BAV, and see if they improve symptomatically. With a high-risk operative approach, we always put in an intraoral bloom pump if there's no contraindication. We use routine dobutamine at this point and wean it very slowly postoperatively, and we do an efficient surgical strategy. Uh, we have, and especially in these patients, you need to avoid patient prosthesis mismatch. So what if the ventricle still doesn't work? For example, if we have sustained hypotension, depressed cardiac index, elevated wedge, end organ malperfusion, um, we need to... Uh, Identify these patients and start pharmacologic resuscitation. Try to find the cause. Is it air? Is it some, something else? It was a mal, uh, not good protection. We need to identify patients who might be in need of advanced therapies. And ideally, if we don't, like I said, if we don't have an MCS program, then we need to consider either early or uh, early transfer or uh, maybe not doing those cases if they have a high risk of uh, poor outcome. Impala tandem heart. I'm sure we're going to hear about all this coming up in the next couple of talks. And we have. Uh, uh, favored uh, ECMO in the patient who we can't get off pump initially as our first uh, line of attack. We found with an early aggressive approach, we can save about 40% 40 40 of these uh, patients uh, with, a, with an early ECMO. Um, so we talked about what defines a high-risk patient. Um, I think we all have our own impressions, but it's certainly ejection fraction, reoperation, uh, strategies for pre-op optimization. We're very uh, pro balloon pump and very pro uh, inotropes and hopefully we'll be able to use Levo soon. Low gradient, low EF takes a special evaluation to make sure that the patient's going to improve. And also, uh, I think we're going to hear in the next few talks what to do next. So thank you for your attention.